Lizzie Borden, top of page 217, day 12, Monday, June 19, 1893. The evidence was in. All that stood between Lizzie Borden and the jury was Governor Robinson and District Attorney Knowlton's closing arguments. It promised to be the greatest courtroom battle that state had ever seen, a contest between Robinson's smooth tongue and Knowlton's incisive mind. The prize, Lizzie Borden's life. All the surprises and contradictions and exclusions had left Knowlton's case weaker than anyone, including the district attorney himself, could have anticipated. Governor Robinson had practically been handed the opportunity to pulverize the prosecution, yet he did not seize it. Perhaps it was because the governor knew Lizzie Borden's greatest danger no longer came from within the courtroom. You will need at the outset, gentlemen, he told the jury, to dismiss your minds entirely, 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 everything that the press ever said about this case, anything that your neighbors have ever said about it, anything that you have ever heard about it except in this courtroom at this time, every rumor that has run about, every idle tale or every true tale that has been told you, you must banish from your minds absolutely and forever. I have no right to tell you that I believe so and so about this case, Robinson continued in the same vein. I may believe all I want to, but my duty is to keep it inside of me, that is all. It was a good legal theory, but for a man as persuasive and, <coughs> excuse me, and engaging as Governor Robinson, it was a disappointment. Robinson's strength was never in the words he chose, but in the way he said them. Always the rise and fall of his voice, his movements, his personality drove his points home. Yet at this critical hour, he chose to hold his personal feelings for this case in check. Not that he wasn't expressive. He was by turns earnest, sarcastic, forceful, but something was missing. Robinson's argument never reached into the heart. The evening standard lamented, never sounded a note of triumph, never once boldly declared Lizzie's innocence. For four hours, he explained and justified Lizzie's actions, when really there was no need. As Robinson himself said, the Commonwealth had not proven one single thing Mr. Moody had promised in his opening remarks. They had failed to show that Lizzie hated her stepmother, that she was plotting murder, or that she had made contradictory statements about her whereabouts during the crime. The prosecution had not proven motive or exclusive opportunity, had not even produced the weapon. Why, no matter which hatchet the police put forward, Robinson mocked, Professor Wood exonerated it. They never would have resorted to the dusty, broken hoodoo hatchet at all if the others hadn't been ruled out. They would have convicted her on rust and a cow on a cow's hair, nor would it do to judge her by the emotions she had or had not expressed throughout her ordeal, Robinson said. Lizzie Borden was innocent because the prosecution had not proven her otherwise. That was the law. Gentlemen, he pleaded with great weariness on your part, but with abundant patience and intelligence and care, you have listened to what I have to offer. So far as you have concerned, it is the last word of the defendant to you. Take it, take care of her as you have, and give us promptly your verdict not guilty, that she may go home and be Lizzie Andrew Borden of Fall River in the blood-stained and wrecked home where she has passed her life so many years." Robinson sat down and put his head into his hands. Beside him, Lizzie Borden, Borden silently reached out and touched his arm. With the exclusion of Eli Benz and Lizzie's inquest testimony, two out of three legs had been kicked out from under the district attorney's case. Time and again, the police officers had contradicted themselves, causing yet more evidence to disintegrate before his eyes. And so, having proved almost nothing, Hosea, Hosea Knowlton relied almost entirely on what he believed. The effect was unmistakable. Even those outside the courtroom were struck by the tremendous vigor of his argument as it rumbled through the open windows. You couldn't see the gestures, you couldn't see the gleam of the eye, but you could stand in the shade of the wide spreading trees and hear the rise and fall of the tones, and then it was easy to imagine the severe words they represented, marveled the Boston Globe. Murder is the work of stealth and craft, Milton reminded the jury, in which there are not only no witnesses, but the traces are attempted to be obliterated. No one would ever know precisely what had gone on behind those tightly locked doors, whether in the years before or the moments after the murder, but circumstantial evidence could be a very bit 
as satisfying as direct evidence, Nolson argued, and he provided a startling conspic- conspicuous example. Nobody has told it, of it as seeing Lizzie Andrew Borden burn the Bedford Court dress. There's not a witness to it, and yet nobody, not even the defense, ever tried to claim the dress had not been burned. From there, Knowlton plunged forward, creating an image of Lizzie Borden that would last over a century. A cunning, savage Lizzie Borden seething with unexpressed hatred. There had been only tiny glimpses of it before, he said, but one August morning, that pent-up rage had finally driven Lizzie to climb the stairs and smash her stepmother to pieces. But Lizzie Andrew Borden, the daughter of Andrew Jackson Borden, never came down those stairs, Knowlton proclaimed. It was not Lizzie Andrew Borden, the daughter of Andrew J. Borden, that came down those stairs, but a murderess transformed from all the 33 years of an honest life, transformed from the daughter, transformed from the ties of affection to the most consummate criminal we have read of uh, in all our history or works of fiction. It was an in- ingenious approach. No one doubted Lizzie's remarkable self-control. The jurors had seen it with their own eyes, and they had also seen it suddenly desert her, when she fainted during the prosecution's opening remarks. It was almost impossible to keep from wondering if Knowlton could be right. Lizzie herself seemed riveted by Knowlton's argument. During Governor Robinson's closing, she had bent her fan around her face and stared into her lap. Now she kept her gaze fixed straight on the district attorney as he spun his tail, staking his entire case on a missing piece of evidence, the note. As far as Knowlton was concerned, the fact that no note calling Miss Sporden to the bedside of a sick friend had ever appeared, that neither the woman who had written it nor the boy who delivered it ever come forward, proved that Lizzie had lied about her stepmother's whereabouts, and there was no reason for her to invent that note unless she had murdered Miss Borden. Lizzie Borden had killed her stepmother in a fit of passion, Knowlton declared, without any thought of how she would answer to her father for what she had done. The imaginary note bought her time, time in which to conceive what Knowlton called a wicked and dreadful necessity, the murder of her father. The risk and the strategy of Knowlton's argument were astounding. He had transformed his case's greatest weakness into the backbone of a chilling, compelling scenario. Where Robinson claims that the lack of evidence proved Lizzie Borden innocent, Knowlton used it to pronounce her guilt. Only the jury could decide. Day 13, Tuesday, June 20th, 1893. Lizzie Andrew Borden, said Chief Justice Mason, although you have now been fully heard by counsel, it is your privilege to add any word which you may desire to say in person to the jury. You now have that opportunity. Lizzie stood and spoke just 13 words. I am innocent, she said. I leave it to my counsel to speak for me. Then the jury stood for a charge from Justice Dewey. He explained all the usual legalities. The prisoner was to be presumed innocent unless the prosecution had proven otherwise. No evidence from the inquest or preliminary hearing could be considered, nor anything Lizzie Borden had said or done since her arrest. Certainly nothing the newspaper said held any weight. He defined reasonable doubt and affirmed the validity of circumstantial evidence, but that was far from all. Straying well outside the customary bounds, Justice Dewey cautioned the jury against stretching the testimony that Lizzie had once called her stepmother a mean, good-for-nothing thing in order to fit the government's theory of motive. One rude and careless remark, Dewey obviously believed, should not outweigh what he called the general tenor of their lives. He undermined the crux crux, crew of Knowlton's closing argument, suggesting that it made no sense for Lizzie to invent an imaginary note she could not account for instead of simply telling her father Miss Borden had gone out. Without ever mentioning it specifically, he discounted Lizzie's infamous remark to Assistant Marshal Fleet, reminding the jurors to consider whether she had ever obstructed any searches or refused to answer any questions, and of course, the dress. Could they, he asked, fit all the witnesses' various descriptions together into a single, identifiable dress? Justice Dewey spoke for almost an hour and a half. It was all worded as neutrally as possible, framed in questions and suggestions, yet there was no doubt Justice Dewey expected, virtually requested, a verdict of not guilty. After all that, 
Could those 12 men possibly find her otherwise? There is so little absolute evidence that everybody can interpret the probabilities and the circumstantial indications to suit himself. The New York Times pointed out, and much will depend upon his general view of human nature and its capabilities. At 324, the jurors marched out and the wait began. Not long after, a square parcel arrived from Miss Lizzie Borden. She opened the lid and her face brightened. Inside lay a large bouquet of cut flowers. Such a small kindness in such a dark hour, but it was enough to make her smile. Barely an hour later, the reporter's seat, the reporter's seat suddenly began to fill. Lizzie Borden went white, then flushed. Within two minutes, judges and jury were back in their places. Lizzie Andrew Borden, stand up, said the clerk. She was so pale, she might have been made of marble, if only marble could quiver. Gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon your verdict? The soft fluttering of paper fans seemed to crackle and snap in the momentous quiet. We have, said Foreman Richards. Lizzie Andrew Borden, hold up your right hand, the clerk commanded. Lizzie detached her hand from the rail of the prisoner's dock. She had been clutching it as though she were the only thing holding it up. Mr. Foreman took upon the prisoner prisoner look upon the foreman. The jurors did an about face and gaze at one on Lizzie Borden. Everybody in the courtroom knew from their faces what the verdict would be, but Lizzie could not make herself look. Her eyes would not obey. They lulled in a great dreadful circle, seeing nothing. What say you, Mr. Foreman? Not guilty, the foreman interrupted. Lizzie Borden dropped as though she'd been shot. A reporter 12 feet away felt the walnut rail shake beneath him as she crashed down onto it, her face buried in her arms, and then the tears, all the tears she had held so tight within herself through all those ten long months, burst free. Cheers rattled the courthouse and tumbled out into the streets of New Bedford. Handkerchiefs waved like little lace-edged banners. Tears shone in the judge's eyes and in the sheriff's, thank God, Lawyer Jennings exclaimed, his voice breaking as he squeezed Colonel Adams' hand. The colonel could not say a word. Governor Robinson beamed upon the jury like a proud new father. Trembling with relief, Jennings pushed his way to the dock and tried to lift Lizzie's head from the rail. It was more than either of them could manage. Only one small bare hand emerged to clasp it. Ever the gentleman, District Attorney Knowlton, crossed the room to shake hands with his opponent, never betraying a trace of disappointment at the verdict. Then wrote the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, Mr. Robinson dodged under the rail of the bar and pushed by the now useless deputy who guarded the prisoner. He stooped down and put his face against hers. Presently, his left arm slipped around her waist, and like the father he had been to her, he raised her up. At the sight of her tear-stained face and waving handkerchief, a jubilant crowd swarmed so thickly around Lizzie Borden, it blocked Emma's path to her sister. Ms. Holmes and Reverend Buck reached Lizzie first. Close behind came Colonel Adams, reaching for her with both hands, and then the jury, marching one by one to shake her hand. She gave them a wealth of glad smiles, greeting each of them with a fresh sparkle of her eyes, a warm grasp of hand, and a look so grateful and kindly that the heart of every man among them must have been touched. His arms still around her, Governor Robinson led Lizzie to a small anteroom where Lawyer Jennings barred the door from all but her most intimate friends. There at last, Lizzie sank into her sister's arms. I want to go home, she told Emma. Take me straight home tonight. Tonight? Yes, tonight, Lizzie said. I want to see the old place and settle down at once. The crowds outside of the courthouse in New Bedford, cheered for 10 minutes, pushing and shoving around her carriage for the chance to shake her hand. Her wreath of smiles, her excited flush made Lizzie seem a different woman. As she waved her handkerchief to the well-wishers, it looked for all the world as though she was bidding the last of her troubles goodbye. But the moon in Fall River was something else altogether. Three of every four people believed Lizzie Borden was guilty, and her friends feared rudeness, even violence, awaited her at home. At the very least, a crowd, if not a mob, would be gathered around number 92. So instead of taking the train and proceeding back to 2nd Street as expected, Lizzie and Emma went by carriage to the brightly lit Holmes residence on Pine Street, where the Bowens, Reverend Jeb, and his family, Lawyer Jennings, and other close friends waited to celebrate. For those few hours, she reveled in her acquittal, proclaiming herself the happiest woman in the world. While over on 2nd Street, a band played Odd Long Sin to appease the 2,000 people waiting to see her. Lizzie Borden could not escape the public's curiosity for much more than an evening. 
When the neighbors noticed her moving from room to room inside her own house in the days that followed, they told the papers. For days, people gathered on the sidewalks of <clears throat> Second Street or peered over the fences, hoping to spy the woman they believed had gotten away with murder. They could not stop looking any more than the papers could stop talking. The most mundane incidents carried headlines that sounded like the case had been cracked. It wasn't Miss Borden announced the New Bedford Evening Journal when a woman resembling Lizzie caused a stir on State Street in Boston. In jail, tra trumpeted the Fall River Globe when Lizzie boarded a train to Taunton to thank the sheriff and his wife for the care and consideration they'd shown her. Not at church, the Boston Globe scolded the first Sunday after her acquittal. They did not know that Lizzie had managed to slip away from Fall River, prying eyes to the seaside town of Newport, Rhode Island, to recuperate privately from her long ordeal. Time did nothing to quell the public's interest. When the real Lizzie Borden was at last spotted in downtown Fall River weeks later, shops and offices emptied into the streets to gawk. Heads popped out of second-story windows. Hoodlums and urchins trailed behind her. Even the sight of a trunk bearing the label L. Borden Fall River, whether it belonged to her or not, brought gawkers running. She could draw the curtains on her carriage tight, do her shopping discreetly in Providence, Boston, and Washington, D.C., but it made little difference. Until the end of her days, no matter where Lizzie Borden went, headlines followed.